It's time for the three question warrant for Biochem 6. Let's get going. What is the most common cause of each of the following? So first we have hypoparathyroidism. The most common cause is actually due to a thyroidectomy. Next we have metastatic disease to the brain. Uh, so remember your mnemonic was lots of bad stuff kills glia. So we know that lung and breast cancer, uh, those uh, like to go just about everywhere. Also remember skin like melanoma, kidney like renal cell carcinoma, and then GI tract tumors also metastasize to the brain as well. Next, we have most common lysosomal storage, that's going to be Gaucher's disease. Most common cause of myocarditis is going to be Coxsackie virus or Echovirus. Next, what amniotic fluid measurement is indicative of fetal lung maturity? So this is the lecithin to sphingomyelin ratio of greater than 2.0. There are other measurements that can be useful in determining that fetal lung maturity, but the high yield one for you to remember is that lecithin to sphingomyelin ratio. Next, what substances stimulate the release of norepinephrine from neurons? So calcium uh, is what we're looking for here, and that's the normal trigger for the release of norepinephrine. But also think about other drugs like amphetamines, ephedrine, and tyramine. All right, that's going to be it for our warm-up. Let's get to that lecture now. I don't want to let this video run long, so I'm going to dispense with a funny little introduction and get straight to the lecture. But I do have a couple of extremely high-yield points to share with you. So to save time, I'm going to give them to you telepathically. So get ready. Got that? Great, let's move on. In this video, we're going to discuss the various kinds of lab techniques used to study gene sequences. And then be sure to stick around for the very end of the video after the quiz because I'm going to go over some tips and strategies for test day. So our first lab technique is called the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. Now, if you want to study a sequence of DNA, a certain allele or whatever, you need more than one copy of that DNA. You can't do much with just one little strand of DNA. You need millions of copies. So PCR is a way to amplify a specific sequence of DNA. There are three basic steps. The first step is denaturation, where you heat the DNA so that the two strands separate, and you end up with two single strands of DNA. Then the second step is annealing. You cool the DNA, and while you're cooling it, you add some pre-made DNA primers that anneal or bind to the specific sequence to be amplified. Now these primers give the DNA polymerases a place to start. Remember, DNA polymerases don't start from scratch. They need primers. Under normal in vivo conditions, they have an RNA primer. And then the third step is elongation, where the DNA polymerase starts to replicate the DNA sequence following each primer. So then you would replicate that entire fragment of DNA so that you go from two single strands of DNA to two double strands of DNA. Then you go through that same process again and again and again, and you get a lot of copies of that one sequence of DNA that you can then analyze. Once you've amplified the DNA sequence with PCR, one of the things you can do to analyze the DNA is called gel electrophoresis. So we use gel electrophoresis to sort and separate PCR products according to size. Now I'm sure you've seen this before, but on gel electrophoresis, you have a tray filled with this gel. And in one end of the gel, you have little divots, which are called wells, and then you put your DNA sample into the well, and then you run a current through the gel. And what is the charge on DNA? Is it negatively charged or positively charged? Well, DNA is negatively charged, right? So negatively charged DNA is going to go toward the positive electrode. And then as it travels through the gel, the DNA separates by size, and the smaller molecules travel farther. You can think of the gel as a bunch of chain link fences, millions of chain link fences that this DNA has to go through. And larger pieces of the DNA can't go through the gel as easily as the short pieces. Think about how difficult it would be for this long stick to be put through a million chain link fences compared to putting a toothpick through a million chain link fences. It would be a lot harder to do the big stick, right? So the larger segments of DNA don't travel as far. They might just go a few centimeters. And then the smallest fragments of DNA are going to travel a lot farther. So you compare this to some standard DNA sequences that you already know the size of. Let's get some practice doing this. Take a look at question number four in your study guide. Now this is very high yield, about four stars. You're probably going to see at least one question like this on your boards. Here we have eight wells across the top, numbered one through eight, and you apply the current and the negatively charged DNA fragment started moving down from top to bottom. So on the left side of the picture, you see that the bigger high molecular weight fragments didn't go very far, but the smaller low molecular weight fragments traveled all the way to the bottom of the gel. So look at the question for number four. If well one contains DNA sample A, well two contains DNA sample B, and well three contains DNA sample C, then what can you say about wells 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8? So in well 1, that sample A basically has four different fragments of DNA. 
You know that because you see four bands on the gel under well one. There's one that's very small, it travels very far, and two that are very large, they don't travel quite as far, and then one that's sort of in the middle. Then look at well two, which is sample B. These are pretty long sequences of DNA, none of them travel very far. And then sample C, over in well three, has these two very small sequences of DNA that travel very far, all the way down to the bottom of the tray, and one sequence that doesn't travel so far. So what I want you guys to do is look at wells four through eight, compare those against wells one through three, and tell me if sample A, B, or C is in well four, five, six, seven, or eight, based on how far this DNA has traveled on gel electrophoresis. So pause the video, take a few seconds to write down your answers, then we'll walk through it together. So what you see here is that on well number four, this sample has bands that match up exactly with well number one. So you know that in well number four, you have sample A, which was in well number one. But there are also some other segments of DNA that you don't see in wells one, two, or three. So not only does well number four have sample A, it also has some other unknown DNA sample that we've not created the standard for. Well number five is segmenting out like well number two did, as well as well number three. See how all those bands match up? So well number five contains both sample B and sample C. Well number six has an unknown DNA sample. It doesn't match wells one, two, or three. Well number seven has sample A and sample B because it looks like a combination of well number one and well number two. And then well number eight has a sample A and sample C because it looks like a combination of well number one and well number three. So this is a type of question that you might actually encounter on your step one exam. Now look at number five. This is another way you might encounter the same type of problem. And again, you just have to know that smaller segments of DNA travel farther, and larger segments of DNA don't travel as far in gel electrophoresis. Over here on the right, you have a couple of DNA sequences, and you can see how they're broken into sequences A through E, and you can tell which is the longest and which is the shortest. So take a look at the gel and label each of the bands on the gel A through E based on the size of the DNA sequence. So the sequence that didn't travel very far, the uppermost one, the one closest to the well, is going to be segment B, because B is the biggest sequence. The next one is E, then A, then D is in delta, and C, the last one, the one that traveled the farthest, that's the smallest sequence. So it's pretty simple. You just have to understand that basic concept. You can also do protein electrophoresis, where instead of using a gel to separate fragments of DNA, you create a gel to separate protein particles. Now, proteins aren't all negatively charged. Some proteins have a positive charge, some proteins have a negative charge. So there are two factors pulling a protein in different directions, the charge of the protein and the size of the protein. So a protein gel electrophoresis would have a well in the middle of the gel, and then the protein bands would segment either to one side or the other, depending on whether they were going toward the negative cathode or toward the positive anode. The one with the stronger charges would travel further, and the larger proteins would not travel as far. So there are two things that would separate out proteins on a gel electrophoresis. So you've amplified the DNA with PCR, and you've separated the fragments by size with electrophoresis. Well, now what? Well, now you can do some blotting techniques. So the first type of blot is a southern blot. A southern blot is the kind of blot they do back home in North Carolina. No, no, no. The southern blot was named after a biologist named Sir Edwin Southern, who invented it. Then all the other blots, northern blot, western blot, southwestern blot, those are all just sort of cutesy derivative names. So you have this segment of DNA that you segmented out on gel electrophoresis, and you want to know what it is. Well, you can compare it to a standard that you already have to figure out if this DNA is the same as that DNA over there. So a southern blot is where you take a DNA sample from the electrophoresis gel, and you put it on a filter or a cellulose membrane. Then you soak that in a chemical that denatures the DNA, so you have separated strands. Then you add a labeled DNA probe that anneals to its complementary strand in your sample. So the probe either has a radioactive label or a fluorescent label. Then you're going to expose that filter to x-ray film, or if it's, uh, you're going to look at the fluorescence, if it's a fluorescent tag. And if it shows up, you know that your probe matches the sample. So if the labeled probe binds, if it anneals, then you know it's the same DNA. You're using a known DNA probe to identify a sample DNA. That's a southern blot, a DNA probe identifying sample DNA. Then a northern blot is very similar, except that instead of your sample being DNA, now your sample is RNA. So you're using a DNA probe to identify an RNA sample. So southern is looking at DNA, northern is looking at RNA. 
Again, that's your sample. And I want you to write down next to that what the probe is. So for the southern blot, your sample is DNA, your probe is DNA. With the northern blot, your sample is RNA, and again, your probe is DNA. Now, with a western blot, your sample is a protein, and your probe is an antibody. So you're using a labeled antibody probe to identify a protein sample. A labeled antibody is used to bind to the relevant protein. So if you're looking for a very specific protein, you have a predetermined antibody that matches it, you'd be doing a western blot. Now, as a quick mnemonic for what kind of samples each blot uses, a student from South Alabama sent in this. For southern blots, I want you to think down south. And the D in down south should make you think of DNA. For northern blots, think about rude Yankees. And that R is for RNA. And then for western blots, think about cattle ranches out west. So west is where we get beef, and beef is protein. Then there's one more blot called a southwestern blot, which is where you're trying to identify transcription factors and other types of DNA binding proteins. So the probe is oligonucleotides, and the sample are the DNA binding proteins. So if you wanted to determine gene expression, which of these blots would you use? Well, if the gene is being translated and then you're going to look at that protein, you could use a western blot. But if you just wanted to look at the RNA sequence that was transcribed, you would use a northern blot. So basically it all boils down to knowing what the sample is and knowing what the probe is for each of those blotting procedures. If you know that much, you're golden for blots. There's another technique called a microarray that's used to study DNA and RNA samples, but that's very, very low yield. I'm not even going to discuss it. The purpose of all these blotting techniques is to be able to see DNA. You obviously can't see it with the naked eye, so you have to do something that's going to show up on an x-ray film or it's going to fluoresce or whatever. Another technique that allows us to visualize what we're working with is called the ELISA test, or enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. ELISA is looking at antigen-antibody interactions. Now, there are two ways to do an ELISA. The first way is that you can use a test antigen to see if the immune system recognizes it. This is called an indirect ELISA. You take the patient's blood and you add some test antigen that's been coupled to an enzyme that produces some color. Now, if the patient has antibodies to that test antigen, the IgG antibodies are going to bind to the antigen and cause that color to show up. So you're actually going to see the color change. You can visualize something that couldn't be seen before. So you're using a known antigen to identify the presence of an antibody. The antigen in this case is the known factor, and if the antigen binds, then you know that the antibody is present in the patient's blood. The other way to do the ELISA is to look for the antigen, which is called a direct ELISA. So you're using a known antibody to identify the presence of an antigen in the patient's blood. So you have a vial of antibodies over here, and you have a sample from the patient, whether it's blood or biopsy tissue or whatever, and you want to know if that sample contains a certain antigen. So you wash the sample with those antibodies, and again, if there's a color change, that indicates that the antigen was present in the sample. So this is pretty basic stuff. It's just allowing us to visualize things that we normally couldn't visualize. Now, one place you're definitely going to see the ELISA test used is in HIV screening. So you're using an HIV antigen, and you're checking to see if the patient has made antibodies to that viral antigen. And if you had a positive ELISA test for HIV, what's a confirmatory test? A Western blot. Then another visualization technique is called FISH, fluorescence in situ hybridization. So instead of the color changing enzyme, now you're using a fluorescent probe. It's, uh, it's not an antibody probe, it's a DNA or RNA probe. It fluoresces. So you have a known segment of DNA or RNA that binds to a specific gene of interest, and then it fluoresces because your tagged probe is designed to fluoresce. So again, it's just a way to visualize something. So the fluorescence indicates that the gene is present. If there's no fluorescence, that gene's been deleted. Another genetic procedure is cloning. We're not talking about Star Wars or Jurassic Park. We're talking about cloning recombinant DNA molecules. So basically, you're taking a piece of mRNA that corresponds to the gene you want to clone, and you're going to use reverse transcriptase to turn that RNA sequence into DNA, which we call cDNA, or complementary DNA. Then you insert that cDNA into a bacterial plasmid and let the bacteria propagate and replicate so you can have lots and lots of copies of that cDNA. And because that cDNA was made from the mRNA, it's not identical to the normal gene. It only contains the coding portion of the gene, only the exons. Now let's shift gears a little bit and talk about genetic engineering and making modifications to gene expression. We're still talking about lab techniques, but instead of analyzing DNA sequences, now we're actually manipulating the genetic code of an experimental animal, like a mouse. 
So you can either delete a certain gene from the mouse's genome, and that's called a knockout mouse because you knocked that gene out, or you can insert genes into the mouse's genome, and that's called a knock-in mouse. Now, if you insert the gene randomly, it's called a constitutive insertion. But if you do a more targeted insertion, putting the gene exactly where you want it because it's structurally homologous to the native mouse gene, that's called a conditional insertion. So basically, just know those terms, knock in and knock out, and know what they mean. Otherwise, this is a fairly low-yield topic. Then one last topic is karyotyping. You know what this is. This is where you get those metaphase chromosomes, where the DNA is all nice and condensed and organized, and you sort the chromosomes in pairs according to size and shape and the length of the arms and the banding patterns that show up when you stain them. And why do we do karyotyping? Well, mainly to diagnose chromosomal imbalances, like trisomies or sex chromosome disorders. So with karyotyping, you're actually physically looking at the chromosome under the microscope to see if there's any big, obvious change in the chromosome. You're not looking at individual particles of DNA, you're looking at the entire chromosome. So on step one, they may describe a patient with trisomy 21 and ask you what genetic tests could have been done in utero, maybe using amniotic fluid, in order to make this diagnosis. And the answer here would be the karyotype, because you'd see three copies of chromosome 21 instead of the usual two copies. All right, that's it for genetics. Let's go ahead and do the end of session quiz. All right, first question. What's the difference between southern blot, northern blot, and western blot? So with the southern blot, the sample is a DNA and the probe is DNA. With the northern blot, the sample is RNA and the probe is DNA. And then with western blot, the sample is a protein and the probe is an antibody. Next, what type of test uses a known antigen to discern the presence of an antibody? That's the ELISA test. And the last one, what type of test is performed in order to diagnose chromosomal imbalances? That's going to be karyotyping. So that's it for Biochem 6. Now, if you're watching these videos in the recommended order, you've made it about two-thirds of the way through the Part 2 videos. So let's take just a minute to think about how to approach the last few days of your study process. First of all, if you finish going through the Part 2 videos, and say you have a week or so before your test day, you might take your main review book with all the annotations you've been making and divide the number of patients number of pages by five days and dedicate yourself to reading that number of pages every day. So you're going to get through the whole book one last time over the course of five days. And as you do this, keep a list of small details that maybe you've overlooked or that you don't feel like you've mastered. Then review that list at the end of each day and at the beginning of the next day. And that process is going to ensure that you've read everything one last time in the last five days before your test. You should also go back through your DIT study guide and review the rapid-fire facts and anything else that you noted as being particularly important to remember. Then, on the last day before the text, relax a little bit, especially in the afternoon and the evening. Get a little exercise, eat a nice healthy dinner, get a good night's sleep. Make sure you have your ID and your USMLE admission pass and you have directions to the testing center and it's all gathered up so you're not scrambling around looking for all that stuff on the test day. Make sure you set your alarm, or two or three alarms. There's plenty of time for a relaxed morning and a good breakfast. You want to dress comfortably, not just in terms of whether the clothes are comfortable, but also are you going to be self-conscious or distracted thinking about whether or not people are looking at you. If you feel most comfortable being a little dressed up, go with it. You want to pack a lunch and some snacks. You want to bring a jacket or a sweatshirt in case the testing center is kind of cool. And then finally, we put together a short list of some things we think you might want to put on your marker board at the beginning of your first block. That's entirely up to you, but if there are things that you know you're likely to get hung up on, write them down. All right, that's the end of this genetics portion of biochem. Next up is psychiatry.